join Time Magazine's lead education reporter alongside global educators and advocates to explore the impacts of teaching forgiveness. I teach forgiveness because it can have a positive impact in my students' families. It helps my students thrive in the face of a positive. Students who can forgive are happier. Join us to hear from teachers and thought leaders on how and why to include forgiveness in your classroom. rise will bring widespread devastation and unprecedented extreme weather. New coronavirus cases emerge across the country. Obesity rates have more than doubled in kids. Cape Town is running out of water. Welcome. Uh, my name is James Sue John. I'm the Executive Director at Challenge Partners. And it's my very, very great pleasure to welcome our guest panellists today, 
and indeed everyone who is joining to watch from around the world. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Uh, world Education Week is a great event and we're delighted to be part of it. It really does fit with our ethos as a charity, as Challenge Partners has at its core a focus on excellent practice, sharing the best in schools and trusts so that practitioners can learn from each other in a structured way. And most importantly, more children can benefit then from an education for all. I'm a former head teacher of a London secondary school, Lampton School in West London, which fe featured in the Ofsted publication, 12 outstanding schools, schools excelling against the odds. Later, while still working as a head teacher, I was seconded part time to be the director of the London Leadership Strategy for secondary schools during the London Challenge a school improvement programme which transformed London schools and the effects are still felt today. It led to better outcomes for pupils, for young people, and was replicated in other parts of uh, England. And it continues to draw interest from around the world as a model. When that programme finished in 2010, we set up Challenge Partners to continue the pioneering work to encourage schools to challenge each other, but also to share excellent practice. I'm delighted to have three panellists with us today. Rob Carpenter, Chief Executive of a group of schools in London and South East England and a senior partner for Challenge Partners. He will share, share the excellent practice developed in his primary schools to develop a global curriculum which reflects the diverse community in which those children are actually uh, living and working in. Uh, apologies for that noise. I think we might have sorted it out now as we go as we go forward. I'm also pleased to have Shalina Patel participating in today's session. Shalina is head of teaching and learning at the secondary school in Brent, Claremont High School, uh, whose work, her work on decolonising the curriculum has been acclaimed and shared across the UK and beyond, I think, as well, Shalina. So wonderful to have you here today. And finally, Dr. Kate Chatwell, who will talk about our model for sharing excellent practice across our partnership. Continuing the theme of global diversity, it is clear that the murder of George Floyd, George Floyd made the need to focus on diversity and inclusion in our schools even more compelling than it already was. And our model, we feel, ensures that we can find and accredit emerging excellent practice in this sphere, sphere and share it across the net, our network, as we do in other aspects of our work as well. Now, I know that some of you tweet. So just a reminder of the World Education Week hashtag, which is hashtag World Edu Week. And it would be brilliant if you could do that. Uh, and my colleague Rebecca will also post in the, in the Twitter handles of our speakers in the in the chat. So you'll be able to see uh, and be able to communicate with the people who are on the call today. Now, after our speakers have talked about their work, uh, I will take questions from the audience. So please post these in the question and answer part of the chat as they talk and we can come back to them. It is possible to identify yourself, please. That would be really brilliant. Uh, and also, if you've got a question for a particular individual to signpost that would also be great. Uh, so that's the kind of general introduction. So uh, a bigger introduction now to, to Rob Carpenter. Uh, Rob is the CEO of the Inspire Partnership Academy Trust and the author of A Manifesto for Excellence in Schools. It's a great read. He has school leadership experience in a range of contexts, including schools in special measures and schools serving a high proportion of disadvantaged young people. Rob is also a member of the Association of School and College Leaders Council as a primary representative. In 2016, Rob worked with the Department for Education and the Teaching School Council to review primary teaching. Rob is now going to share his approach to developing a global curriculum and his outward facing approach to working with other schools, which he sees as a moral imperative. I think he's also going to frame this within the context of a kind of national, international perspective. So it's going to go straight over now to you, Rob, for your input. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Delighted to be with you all this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to kick off by uh, sharing with you a provocation which will help frame some of the conversation, which is what is the purpose of education and what do we think the purpose of education should be for? And to answer that question, what I want to do is, is, is rest, lay to rest the myth that learning is a trade off between knowledge and skills. My argument is actually we need both and that when we place 
the concepts of curriculum rooted deeply within a global context that helps young people make sense of the world. We also develop agency, engagement, and that helps young people as well to connect with the knowledge that we teach through curriculum. So I want to start by saying very clearly, I don't think it's an either or conversation. The second thing to say is that within the English education system, there has been a lot of research published from charities, uh, the Good Childhood Report, the Social Finance Report, which has highlighted just how damaging the global pandemic has been in terms of its impact on young people. And I think there is a role that school plays to support children, pupils in addressing and coming to terms with some of the impact that they've had to face over the past two years. Um, and I want to share a few thoughts on that uh, and, and, and how a global curriculum might help with that process. Um, I, and I also feel very strongly that it's not that our young people in our schools today lack agency or lack engagement, far from it. What we know from um, surveys and studies is that pupils and young people are deeply committed to learning, to wanting a better society. They see themselves as civic leaders. They want to make a difference. But what they're struggling most with is the way in which they see curriculum developing and the way in which they see knowledge in lessons being taught and the relevance that that has to them beyond the school day, beyond their time in a classroom. So in our primary partnership of nine schools, we have developed what we call the global curriculum or a global curriculum, which is really about helping our young people see how they can make sense of, make a difference within, and as Gert Biester described, meet the world. And, and what we think and feel is that if we can create really strong curriculum models where knowledge is being developed in a, in, 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 in a very positive way, but frame it within a context of a global curriculum, it automatically leads to a deeper sense of agency because young people are connecting what they're learning about to the wider world, to their local communities, to a, a, a global audience and becoming civic leaders within their school communities and beyond. And we've seen the impact of this in terms of uh, outcomes, engagement, attendance levels in schools, and, and how confident our young people are when they leave us by the age of 11 years old and go off to secondary school, because they're able to um, have conversations about learning, they're able to um, describe how their learning is having an impact, not just within their local community, but um, beyond that as well, and also, how they think and feel about the world. So, as I said, it's not a binary debate between knowledge and skills. It's really about challenging this concept that the purpose of education is about passing a test score or is about getting a job. It is about those things. Those things are important. But for me, the most fundamental purpose of education is to ensure that our young people can meet the world, be present in the world and make a difference. So our curriculum in detail we take um, eight curriculum themes, which include peace and conflict, diversity, social justice, uh, environmental awareness. And within each curriculum topic or theme, we select uh, a challenging text or book that allows them to learn about some quite complex issues and themes through a high quality reading resource uh, and then link that to the history content or the geography content. So. I was in schools today and, and just to give a flavour of it, in, in one of our schools, children in year five and six are learning about the Democratic Republic of Congo. They're learning about deforestation and its impact within the local community, but its impact internationally. It's giving them a voice. They're seeing themselves as change makers. They're learning uh, knowledge and skills that will help them come to terms and understand better some of those complex themes, which, which I think if you teach in a in, in a contextual way, young people, even as at the age of nine and ten years old, can uh, can develop quite complex understandings of that. We're also um, teaching children about the impact of palm oil and, and, and how its production is leading to um, 
uh, the destruction of rainforests in certain parts of the world and, and what they can do within a family context to tackle that. We held a debate with our families and parents to give our young people a chance to talk about this with them. And the impact of that has been that more parents are saying that they're, they're shopping more environmentally conscious ways, they're developing a better understanding. So for me, the whole, the whole purpose of a global curriculum, it is about standards, it is about high quality expectations within the classroom and, and building of knowledge, but it's also about giving our young people a strong voice to make good choices as they enter the next phase of their education. Thank you, Rob. Um, that, that was that was fascinating and, and, and really does align with the video that we watched at the beginning, which is about children learning, but also thriving and having those skills for the 21st century, which are so, so crucial and, and good to dispel this rather arid argument of a, a kind of system where you have to be knowledge based or skills based. Our children need all of those things. And I'm sure it's a very rich curriculum in your school and I really do like the the point about civic leadership uh, that's not just for adults that's for young people as well as we as we move forward so so thank you very much uh, Rob and now I'm going to move on to introduce Shalina uh, Shalina Patel uh, a little bit more detail uh, from your biography Shalina so Shalina is head of teaching and learning as I've said and a teacher of history very important job as I was a history teacher once um, at Claremont High School uh, Academy in London. She won the Silver Pearson Teaching Award in 2018 for Outstanding Teacher of the Year. That's, that's amazing. Uh, Shalina is committed to teaching diverse and hidden histories and runs workshops for schools on practical steps towards decolonising the curriculum. She also won the 2020 GG2 Inspire Award for Leadership for her work with young people on this theme. Shalina showcases her support for celebrating diverse histories through the History Corridor account on Instagram, which I believe has over 20,000 global followers, right, which is, which is pretty amazing. She is frequently featured in the media to discuss the importance of diversity within the curriculum and is a regular guest on podcasts, news and radio channels across the BBC. Shalina is also currently writing a book, which we're all looking forward to reading, uh, which is centred around her passion for uncovering and teaching history that goes beyond the Eurocentric mainstream. And she's now going to explain how shared practice informed her own practice and why she considers it to be so vital also to reach out and work with teachers and leaders on this important theme of decolonising the curriculum. So it's over to you, Shalina. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Uh, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sue. So um, one of the biggest uh, hurdles that I find that schools uh, find really, really difficult when it comes to this kind of work is actually what does decolonising the curriculum actually mean? And the reason why schools, I, there are some schools certainly that are quite nervous about this kind of work is because there are so many misconceptions around the, la the language that is used. Um, so as Sue said, I run a uh, training which I've really carefully framed as practical steps to decolonising the curriculum because I find that that can make people feel a little bit more comfortable um, with this because it will arm them with some really easy ideas that they can implement as soon as you know as soon as they get back into school so for me one of the first things is making the language really really clear what do we mean by diversity what do we mean by decolonising and what is the relationship between uh, between the two. So what I often find really, really helpful is actually to do some myth busting with the schools that I work with and really explaining very carefully that when we're talking about, I always say that embedding diversity is leading you on the on the road to decolonisation. Um, and I always start by saying that we are not talking about abolishing the canon. And the reason why I say that is because there are certain um, there are certain newspapers and certain areas in society, certainly that seem to think that decolonising means burning the works of Shakespeare, for example, and that is absolutely not what this is. There's so there are so many myths, as I said, around this around this sort of work. So a big part of the process, the place that I always start as a history teacher um, is I always say to people, think about when you learned about World War One at school. And I always say, did the voices and experiences of non British and non white men and women, did they feature at all? Um, and I always say to the history teachers in, in the school, do those faces feature in the textbooks that you use? And the answer is always a massive resounding no. 
And the reason why I start with that is because I think it's an area that everyone can kind of can really think back to when they were at school, because World War One is something that we teach to everyone in our schools. Yet, for some reason, the voices and experiences of millions of people that contributed to that is just a lot of the time it's hidden, invisible, or sometimes perhaps it's included, but it's tokenistic rather than actually being embedded in a diverse way. Um, and I know that Rob talks about uh, the need for schools to be places that are knowledge rich. And so the reason why I start there is because, you know, we know that the our experiences in lots of ways frame how the way we view knowledge, but also the knowledge that we have as well. So it's really, really important, I think, to start there and really myth bust about what these things, what these things actually mean. And hand in hand with that, I always say, you know, if you want to tokenistically insert diversity within your curriculum, you can do that. You can do that really easily. You can add a lesson about X, Y, Z people here and there, and you'll, you've then tick box done diversity. But if you really want to embed diversity and really go down that road towards decolonization, then I have to make it really clear to people that this is, you have to make it clear to your staff, everyone in your school, this is not another fleeting initiative. It's not going to be something that is going to be possible to do overnight. And in fact, it's never going to be done because you're constantly going to be reflecting on what exactly you're offering to your to your students as well as what's happening within your school. I also say to people that the road to decolonization is uncomfortable. And if it's not uncomfortable, then you're doing something wrong because actually it, re it does require a huge amount of soul searching. It requires a huge amount of time of, of reflection. And I'll talk a little bit briefly later about how racial literacy kind of fits in here. I also say to people, you know, that it's not just about what's happening inside the classroom, but it's also about all levels of, of the practices within your school from teacher training. You know, the moment that your student teachers come in, is it clear to them that this is what your school is is about? And this is what this is how you want your, your students to be uh, to be taught. It's about your pastoral guidance as well. It's about your recruitment practices. It's so many things. So, like I said, I always say, do you want to insert diversity or do you want to embed it? Because you want to insert it you don't need to be you can switch off now but if you want to embed it then there are practical steps that you can take and the first place is actually understanding what do you what does it mean and you might have to recalibrate your vision because actually because as i said there's so many misconceptions out there so that's the first place to start and the second place that i always the second place that i always go with uh, with with schools is to present them with three questions because i think as teachers we know how powerful questions can be and the three questions that i that i say is First of all, do your students see themselves within your curriculum offer? But then the flip side of that is how do they see others, which I think is a really, really important question, because we often ask, you know, do, do you, can't, you know, we say you can't be what you can't see. Do you see yourself? But actually, we need to think about the flip side of that. So how do you, do your pupils see themselves? But how do they see others? And then the follow up question to that I always ask is what narrative is your curriculum offering? And this can be a lot more difficult in secondary schools than in primary schools in, in lots of ways, in the sense that you've got those, you know, there's a lot less freedom in, with your exam classes, for example. But certainly in those younger years, is there a school wide discussion about the narrative that your curriculum is offering? Or is it down to individual departments and a hope that they're kind of chained together by something? Um, so those are the three questions that I that I present uh, that I present staff with. And then what I tend to do is offer out some reflective questions, because ultimately I always say to people that, you know, you're never going to be starting from zero out of ten. There will have been work that you've been doing on this in your school already. I think it's really, really important to, because as teachers, we do tend to be a bit half glass empty sometimes and think that, oh, we need to do X, Y and Z things. But actually, first of all, it's about reflecting, well, what are you doing really well when it comes to kind of embedding diversity in your curriculum? And then how can you how can you do one step better, two steps better? So I'll just give you a couple of examples of some questions that I ask that can be really interesting. So, for example, um, in RE, for example, you know, do you explore diversity within particular religious groups? Because actually religious groups are not a monolith. So is the diversity within those groups being uh, being unpicked, being talked about? Do the resources in your RE department, do they do those religious figures? Are they a reflection of their likely ethnicity, for example, or are they not? When we're thinking about something like DT, you know, do the examples that you use reflect a multicultural society? When you're asking the students to do projects, is the imagined user always assumed to be able-bodied, for example? Those kinds of questions are really interesting. And of course, with history, I have so many questions. Uh, you know, a really, really, really useful one to start with is where does black history in your school begin? Because the art, it should not certainly start with slavery, for example. So thinking about what are you teaching your students prior to that? Um, so that black history is not simply framed within within the context of slavery. 
same with empire is empire framed as ex ex exploration and settling in new countries these countries were not new these countries were not being settled in when there were people living there already but it, you know and, and unpicking that idea of exploration for example but what about what about other intersections if you ask most people they will say the only time i learned about women at school was was the suffragettes for example believe it or not the suffragettes did a lot more uh no, sorry women did a lot more than just being part of the suffragette movement so think about those questions is really 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 important and the final thing, um, one of the final things that I always talk to staff about is the importance of racial literacy. I don't believe that decolonising the curriculum can happen within a school unless there is time given to making sure that, that staff are becoming more and more racially literate. So a couple of, of words, for example, that are really, really helpful here are words like intersectionality. Is your curriculum intersectional? Are you making sure that there are that all these all different groups of people are being represented in ways that are not tokenistic women race ability etc cetera, etc cetera. things like colorism for example when you look at your displays around your school are there people that are shown as not only you know black white asian etc but different shades of those people as well because we know that colorism is something that is particularly amongst girls for example is something that they struggle that they tackle every single day um so those are some of my tips for the, or the steps that I often speak to schools about. There's so much that goes into wanting to decolonise the curriculum, but I think those are really, really good places to start thinking about those questions, but also thinking about racial literacy as well. Thank you so much, Selena. That's a really passionate um, and, uh, and, and really powerful presentation there on, on your very, very important work. And the, the key being this is a whole school issue. This is a whole system issue this requires leadership right throughout the uh, institutions that we serve in um, and and that uh, you know in, in many respects starting where we are though those are important audits of, of looking at current provision uh, moving forward is quite a good segue into into our work at challenge partners when we we work with peers to to actually look at that so thank you so much i'm going to move on to introduce um dr kate chatwell and um, so Kate joined Challenge Partners as Chief Executive in 2018. She's passionate about education and social justice and Kate holds a PhD in education policy and has more than 15 years experience in leading policies and programmes to improve educational outcomes for young people. Some of her recent roles include Executive Director at Teaching School, so that Teaching School Alliance and Chief Programme Officer at Future Leaders Trust. Kate spent 11 years at the Department for Education, where I first met her actually, uh, where she led the National Challenge Programme. Uh, she is trustee and chair of standards at Step Academy Trust and co-founder of the Leading Women's Alliance. So an amazing uh, biography, there. A biography there. Kate will provide a brief overview of our underpin underpinning peer review and knowledge exchange model in Challenge Partners. So over to you, Kate. Thank you very much, Sue. Um, I don't know about the rest of you on this, but I could listen to Rob and Shalina all day. That was absolutely fascinating from both of them. And I think we're really fortunate within Challenge Partners to work with incredible leaders like Rob and Shalina and the schools that they are involved in leading. But one of the challenges that we face as a system, and I don't just mean this as a UK education system, but actually as a global education system, is that the great practice that's been exemplified here by Rob and Shalina gets locked up within individual schools or sometimes within individual departments within schools and it's not shared widely so there are many children that miss out from that kind of great expertise and practice that's on display today and that you can see in Rob and Shalina's schools every single day so I think events like this World Education Week are really important in holding a global dialogue that enables some of that great practice to be shared so that children around the world can benefit. And that's something that we've been trying to do in England for the last decade through Challenge Partners. And so our job really is to unlock and unleash that expertise and excellence that could otherwise be trapped within individual institutions, individual schools. 
And the way that we do that is by facilitating challenge and collaboration between schools. That's why we're called challenge partners. Uh, you can hear the challenge bit there and uh, partnership, obviously all about collaboration. But it's really important to us that that is hard edged collaboration. This isn't soft and fluffy. Let's get together and have a nice chat. This is about really challenging each other, having those courageous conversations in the interests of all children and young people to make sure Sure that they are getting the best possible deal every day. So challenge is absolutely key because it's only by kind of robustly evaluating what's going on in schools and challenging the people that are running them that we can identify where excellence really resides. So every year each of the schools within our network of excellence uh, hosts a three day visit from external reviewers uh, drawn from other schools across our network who are led by a lead reviewer who is uh, somebody who's an absolute expert in school evaluation and has been rigorously trained by us. They spend three days in each school really getting beneath the skin of what's going on in that school, identifying the areas of great practice and also the things that need to improve to move that school forward. And of course, that's really important to the host school because it enables them to think about how to take the next steps on their improvement journey. And, you know, as Shalina said in a slightly different context, that journey is never finished. You never stop improving. You have never achieved uh, complete excellence. And one of the great things about the schools in our network is that they are all hungry to keep getting better. So that peer review gives them an idea about what are the things that they need to work on to improve, as well as what are the things that are already going well. And of course, for, for those reviewers who are going in to visit from other schools, they see all of this great practice firsthand. They have three days to really get underneath it, to fully understand it and to reflect on their own practice in their own school and think, actually, is something that I'm seeing here better than we do? And might I want to take it back and Im embed it in my own school? Or actually, am I quite secure having seen a contrasting bit of practice that what we're doing is the best practice for our context? So there's a real benefit there. But I think for, for us as a, a charity that's really about um, transforming life chances and tackling educational disadvantage, it's the benefits that we get to the system through this process that are most important. Because by undertaking those rigorous peer reviews and identifying where really excellent practice is, we know that the knowledge uh, that we're sharing around the system is the very best. So we can play that role with absolute confidence in ensuring that excellent practice becomes common practice across the system. So that foundation of challenge is really important, but then enabling the collaboration between schools to share that practice is absolutely critical. And one of the things that uh, both Rob and Shalina have done within our own context is to, um, through online seminars like this, but going on much longer, share in great detail what it is they're doing in their schools, in their areas of expertise. So Shalina talked about her approach to provoking other school leaders to think about decolonising their own curriculum. Imagine having half a day or even a day with Shalina to really be taken through all of those steps and how powerful that is and that's something that we uh, really facilitate at Challenge Partners and one of the reasons that we're really excited to be part of World Education Week this week is because we want to extend that conversation wider because I'm sure that there's incredible practice going on in the schools that all of you are from and we want to hear about that and learn from it and benefit from it and think about how one of the good things that comes out of the pandemic over the last 18 months might be that by getting us all in online forums on this it is going to make it easier for that sharing of practice to go on ac across the globe. So it's not just all children and young people in England that are benefiting from the practice that we're sharing, but those around the world. And similarly, the children in England can benefit from the great things that are going on in uh, Iraq, the United States, Japan, wherever you're all from. So really excited to be part of this um, and to be showcasing two of our great leaders and talking a little bit about how we share their expertise. And if you do want to be part of that conversation with us, um, Rebecca will drop into the chat the email address that you can use to get in touch with us. We'd love to hear from you.
Thank, thank you, Kate. Um, and I think I would echo the generosity of our, our school leaders um, of really being keen to see that they are they're responsible uh, for their own schools, but they, they want to go beyond that and they really feel they need to serve the needs of, of children uh, locally, nationally and of course today globally by, by sharing this expertise as we as we move forward. Well, we've got one comment in the in the chat, which is welcome from Iraq from Shamal. Have we any questions for our panelists today? If so, could you place them in the Q&A and then we can actually pose them to them? We'll wait for a moment for you to reflect. And perhaps while we're waiting, I'm going to talk to Rob and ask him from what you've heard from Shalina today, Rob. Um, any kind of questions for Shalina or, or reflections and comments uh, on that really yeah. powerful and passionate input. Yeah, Shalina, hi. It's great to hear, hear you, as Sue said, so passionately how you articulate the work that you're doing in your school. I suppose my, my reflection is um, it, it takes courageous leadership to, to do what you're doing and also to, and I understand actually from your perspective, it's not courageous because it, it's what needs to be done. Um, but so few schools are taking that step. My, my questions and reflections are around, one, how do you plan and prepare the curriculum for your staff that enables them to then develop that with young people in your school community? And two, linked question, how do you also work with governors, trustees, so that they really understand the paramount importance of this work and the longer term benefits of, of taking those brave steps across schools um, that you're working with. Thanks, Rob. So the the first thing about how do we kind of plan and prep um, for this? So the key, the killer answer is always providing time. Um, and that is the biggest thing. And so, for example, for the last, obviously, since the pandemic has been on, obviously, we've had everything has been online, etc. when it comes to our CPD and our inset. But um, what we have made sure is that there is a huge amount of our CPD and inset time is dedicated to providing staff with a time to do this within their departments. But what's really, really important for me as well is that when I when I presented those three key questions, you know, do your students see themselves? How do they see others? What's the narrative of your curriculum? For that last question, what we've made sure is that there are opportunities that we provided for heads of department, for example, to get together and actually talk about that last question about what narrative is our curriculum offering. Because I think we love to think that we do cross curricular work in secondary schools, but it's actually really, really challenging to do that. And so what we found is really giving people the time to be able to do that. And I think the other thing is as well is that making it really clear to people, we you know we present every department with a list of questions, but with a list of provocations, basically, like I like I said, you know, in DT, do you always present, uh, you know, these projects as being for able for able bodied people, for example, and we give departments um, the opportunity to put some time into a department meeting to discuss that with everyone in their department. And we get the minutes of those meetings so that we know what conversations are happening. And also we would fo we follow up with that with their line managers. Well, what action are you taking now based on those particular things? So I think for me, the biggest thing is giving time. And, and again, I suppose it sort of relates to, to your second point as well, which is that and this is what Kate said as well, obviously, that in order for this work to really happen, it has to involve everyone at every single level. So we make sure that we invite governors onto our on, into our CPDs, into our um, into our training days, for example. We're very lucky that our chair of governors is incredibly passionate about this work as well. Um, and we make sure that and I make sure that I check in with her about the progress that we're that we're kind of making with different departments. So I think that communication is really, really um, is really, really key. So and you're right, I think that was implied when you were when you were saying this, that there are absolutely so many schools out there that really want to engage in this kind of work and they're very nervous about it. And they're particularly nervous about the language around decolonizing and they're particularly nervous about racial literacy and how do they approach that? And I often get questions from schools, you know, saying, you know, we have primarily staff that are all white, for example. Um, how do we how do we start this kind of work with our with our staff? And the way that I always say the thing that I always say to, to schools is start with unpicking this idea of a colorblind approach. Because I think if we if we start to unpick that kind of language that, oh, no, I'm colorblind, I don't see X, Y and Z, um, then it's uncomfortable, as I said before, but it's essential in order for that time that we're giving to prep and plan this 
in order for it to actually work and to blossom, I think. Um, so for me, the, the simple answer is time. Make sure that everyone's good, because by giving people time, you're demonstrating to people this is important. And unless you're unless you're providing teachers with that, unfortunately, it's just not going to happen, is it? I think. So very long winded answer to your question there. Uh, no, I, I think I think it's really powerful, Shalina, because I mean, for time to create that capacity, however, you have to get buy in completely from the leadership of the school. I mean, and your reflection, <laughs> do you think our school leaders are well trained or educated in this field? And if not, what can we do about that? Yeah, absolutely. And most and most of the schools that I'm asked to, to speak to about this, they will they will often have reflected prior to asking me to come in and say, I know that I'm not the best person to talk to my staff about this. And I know that there's so much work that I have to do. And I always say to people that as much as I would, I, I maybe am an expert in this, I am still learning all of the time, all the time. And I always give people examples of how I'm of how I'm all, all, always learning as well. And for me, the answer I always give is, again, you've got to provide that time and reflection space for yourself. And unfortunately, there is, and I always say to people, you know, you can give people a glossary of, you know, the word of terminology, for example, and you could almost set it like a vocabulary test. But the problem with that is, is that understanding what the words mean, and that is, there's a difference between understanding what the words mean and understanding how they manifest in your school, how they manifest in society. So for me, I always, I always, I always provide a suggested reading list for staff before I start doing any work with them and say, look, these are, if you do want to embark on this work, you do have to do some, re you have to treat it almost like you're, because you're re-educating yourself. And in order to re-educate yourself, you have to do the reading. Um, and so I often will provide examples of work um, that I think is really thought provoking and challenging as well. And I always say that if you're really dedicated to this, you will, you will want to, before you go to bed, you know, read a chapter of this book. And if you find that your team are not willing to do that, then you're not going to be able to embed, to embed this work and truly decolonize because it has to, it has to be a genuine it has to be genuine from the top um down definitely so so that shared language being really really important yeah. and that shared understanding um so i think kate i think you said that you intimated that you might have a question for for rob from his little input do you want to ask him your question so Hold your breath, Rob, and see what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, I would. And obviously, I'd like to encourage those in the audience to come forward with their, their questions or indeed their examples of great practice, because we'd love to hear them. And obviously, we're talking about decolonising the curriculum quite a lot, because that's from our English perspective. I guess in other countries, you will be thinking about different ways in which uh, you need to change your curriculum to reflect the kind of diversity of your uh, countries and your world and so on. So we'd love to hear about that. And along that theme, I suppose, the question I want to pose to Rob is you're obviously thinking very hard, Rob, about uh, global curriculum in your schools. To what extent are you able to connect the children within your schools with communities in other countries um, to, you know, hear more about their experiences firsthand? And what would you see the benefits? What would you like to see through kind of greater global connection between schools and school communities yeah uh, Kate I think it's a great question and it's not it's not something I think we do particularly well um, and I think it would be a great next step for us because we have these great curriculum topics which um, build pupils understanding of themselves their local community their place within community and the community place within the wider world but I don't think what we've taken it to is, is a level where we're engaging in meaningful ways with young people from some of the parts of the world that we're kind of trying to shine a light on in some of our curriculum themes. I also think, though, Kate, it's really important, and I should have said this earlier, it's really important to ensure that a, a little bit, as Shalina said, our, our starting point is positive representation of community. Um, you know, we want our young people to see themselves in our curriculum and we want our we want our curriculum to be a lived experience rather than an intended one and to that end there's a couple of points one is making sure that our staff see themselves as um curriculum designers but also they see themselves as the the manifestation of a curriculum um, in other words what i'm saying is no point in us teaching um young people teaching people about themes to do with 
tolerance, acceptance, diversity, and yet actually our own workforces don't represent that same diversity or our staff aren't modelling the qualities that we need to ensure that we are being seen to be tolerant and, and, and reflective learners. So a little bit like my point to Shalina, we've, we've almost got a curriculum for staff, which is kind of trying to highlight the characteristics we want our staff to exemplify when they're teaching. So so that, that that that's one point. And then in terms of that positive, positive representation, what we don't want to see happening is um, for our, our children when they're learning about, you know, amazing opportunities to better understand what's happening in the Democratic Republic of Congo or what's happening in another part of the world. What we don't want is for children to see those representations as negative representations. We want children to to, to understand in, in, in all facets of, of the debate, the argument, the kind of complexities of life, because schools are complex communities. And and back to that point of la about language, um, I think when you do teach young people about the different perspectives and children are able to uh, empathise with those different viewpoints, it gives them a, a language and a literacy to better understand themselves, their place in the world. And that, for me, is what leads to um, our kids achieving what we call in England the greater depth standard, which is about children being able to argue for, against, reason, problem solve, challenge, etc. Now, I, I think the next iteration of, 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 of what we're trying to do, Kate, is, is you're kind of hinting at, and your question is, how do we make this live and real? And I, I think that's where we've got so much to learn from other countries, because uh, British Council exchange programmes, um, international study visits, opportunities to connect with young people in different parts of the world. I think a lot of other countries do that really well. You know, for example, we host visits to our schools from overseas teachers and um, and, and we receive kind of messages from young people, but we're not so good at actually re replicating that in the, in the way we're getting at this. I think it's a really good point you've made. Yeah, thank, thank you, Rob. And um, although it is true, as Kate said, in this digital world now, we can actually connect you know, young people up in different parts of the world to have the, this kind of global conversation, which I think it could be really helpful for their education and to as you say it's about understanding other people and other other perspectives uh, as, as we move forward um kate um we've had we've just had a new secretary of state uh in sort of put in place in in our country um in in terms of this whole theme and maybe beyond that um what would your advice be to the secretary of state if if there was to be any impact in this particular issue of, you know, the, the, the curriculum that we teach, the global curriculum that we are, we, we feel is very, very important. Uh, and anything else you might suggest um, to that person uh, that kind of gets in the way of actually uh, this this kind of, I suppose, this this vision that we have. Thanks, So just, just a small question then. Um, I mean, I think successive secretaries of state from all political parties have talked about wanting our education system to be world class. Um, and I don't think you can be world class if you're closed off to what's going on in the rest of the world. So I think that kind of genuinely looking out and, you know, not being sort of selecting of what you look at in a way that kind of post hoc rationalises what it is you'd first thought of, I think would be uh, a really good place to start. So what can we really learn from other jurisdictions about the things that they're doing well? And I think, you know, aligned to that, something that we spend a lot of time on at Challenge Partners is thinking about how the best schools continue to get better. And inevitably, with limited resources, what governments tend to focus on is underperformance and how do you get underperforming schools up to something approaching the, the average, which, of course, is really important. And, you know, we want to make sure that every child gets the best possible education that they can. But actually, if you don't stimulate and nurture those high performing schools to continue to get better, then you won't get a world class education system. What you'll get is regression to the mean. Whereas what we're all about, of course, is upwards convergence within challenge partners. 
And again, I think that those kind of global connections have a really important role to play there um, because at Challenge Partners, you know, for our high performing schools, yes, we connect them with each other. We also try and connect them with businesses and other sectors to see if there are things that they can learn there. But I think connecting beyond uh, geographical boundaries is really important. And, you know, I, I think so for school improvement, also for the curriculum, uh, just as both Shalina and Rob have kind of amply ir illustrated, children get a great education when they understand their place in the world and actually get a bit restless about changing it because they have a proper understanding of the inequities uh, around us and the kind of challenges that we all face and how the decisions that they're making, you know, as Rob was talking about palm oil, about their consumption of palm oil within their house in Greenwich, the impact that that might be having on communities on the other side of the world. So I, I think there's something really important there. And so in terms of kind of the things to avoid, there has already been some conversation in the press about a potential ramping up of some of the accountability uh, measures under the new Secretary of State. And I think I would urge him to think very carefully about the unintended consequences of those because often if you narrow a few things, uh, those are the things that get focused on. So Shalina has talked really well about how they've managed to broaden their curriculum, particularly at Key Stage 3, because there is no formal testing at the end of Key Stage 3. So there's freedom for schools to think really carefully and creatively about curriculum. If you reinstate testing there, then there is a risk that's the curriculum will narrow to what's taught in those tests. So I think, you know, breadth, looking up, looking out, making those connections um, at both kind of institutional level, but kind of curriculum and individual pupil level are absolutely things that I would be recommending to the Secretary of State. Thank you, Kate. And, and Rob, you often talk about these, the kind of, I suppose, the, the features of those high performing jurisdictions across the world. Um, and, and what would you say are the the key features of those jurisdictions that we really should think about across all of our, our systems and, and to get them right, uh, whatever we do. Well, I, I suppose, and, and we know this anyway, because of the work that Challenge Partners does, it, it, it's what makes Challenge Partners as a network so powerful, is that what we know is that schools that and, and jurisdictions that place greater emphasis on collaboration rather than competition, um, uh, jurisdictions and, and, and schools that value um, interaction with one another in a non-hierarchical way um, and systematised collaboration, because actually collaboration isn't easy. It's, it's, it's hard to collaborate well. You need to be organised. You need to be open minded to make mistakes and also to receive feedback that you might not always want to hear. Um, in, in many ways, you know, th these high performing systems and, and, and they are there. I mean, th they exemplify the best of collaboration, both at teacher level, but also at student level, too. So, for example, um, the Australian Institute for Teaching and School Leadership, they've created a network which is systematized collaboration. They publish research based on the ways in which schools are learning through networks and sharing examples of practice. We know that in Japan, for example, the way in which they use the concept of lesson study, even deployment of, of teachers as a resource to districts. Um, it's all based on the idea that the the social good, the, the the moral purpose of our work is to is to raise all of the boats in the harbour, not just some. And, um, you know, we see that through um, some great work where, you know, lesson study between more experienced teachers and less experienced teachers is enabling that two, three way learning approach to have real impact. Um, and the other thing to say is, and I think this is a reflection on Kate's point about accountability. Um, I remember Ken Robinson once saying that revolutions start in classrooms, not in head teachers offices. And I, I think it's a reflection on the way in which accountability in our education system has led to a narrative that um, school improvement happens top down. And in actual fact, it often happens in the best schools bottom up because you get great practitioners leading change from within a classroom that, that, that are then able to share that practice amongst a wider group. And, and that becomes the, the new norm. Um, and if we think about challenge partners as an organisation, the whole principle is, is about 
classroom practice impacting across a whole organisation and harnessing the very best of what we see at different schools and, and making meaningful time to share that practice. And, that, you know, so actually to answer your question, Sue, it's kind of stuff we know, really. I think that that's a, an important point because I think top down doesn't necessarily work, but neither does bottom up completely, <laughs> you know, because it doesn't have a systemic effect. And what we've tried to do, I think, in Challenge Partners is just have some systemic effect in terms of us as an organising kind of almost like a kind of middle tier function uh, within our within our particular system. Um, I'm going to ask Shalina if there's anything you wanted to add that you haven't had a chance to to say as we don't have any questions from the floor. Um, so you're going to have the final comment before I round up, Shalina. <laughs> what Rob was just saying about that kind of sharing, uh, that sharing best, best practice, um, something that we did in our school actually, uh, just, just before the pandemic started was, um, and it relates actually back to the question, Robbie, that you asked me, which is what we, what we did is we got some of our teachers, including myself, we got um, staff to actually be the students in a few lessons. And what we said to these teachers, including myself, was we wanted you to really showcase your decolonised uh, lessons and we got every single member of, of staff then attended four mini lessons and the reflection that we got staff to do at the end of it was amazing because not only did they did it give them a greater understanding of how invigorating and inspiring the a decolonised curriculum can be it also gave them a real sense of a reminder of how exhausting it is to be a student as well um, and just how much brain power it takes to be a student and sometimes I think we can lose sight of that can't we um, so I think actually sometimes, you know, you've got, and it relates to what Rob said, we, we've, a lot of the time we've got these, these experts in our own schools and it's just about harnessing that. Um, because I think that's, that, there's, like I said before, there's so much, there will be so much good that's already going, going on in your school and it's about capitalising on that. And as, you, as we've all said, learning from other schools, which is exactly what Challenge Partners is all about, and perhaps start hopefully to learn from beyond these shores as well, um, so that we can better, so that we can, uh, better our own practice and learn learn from others uh, across the waters so those are my final thoughts sharing best practice always is the most productive way to do things in a school i think that's a fantastic example to, to finish on because you, you talked about you know how your training is practical and and there we have a fantastic example and what we what we need of course within our system as well is more time for teachers in terms of their professional development we work longer hours at the chalk face, uh, you know, compared to other other countries and we work with greater intensity. Um, so I'm going to round up now. Thank you so much to our panellists. I hope those people who are on the call have actually enjoyed that debate amongst our, our, our panellists. But we have to close now. We have to finish exactly on time. Uh, and I think we should just about be able to do that. So it's a reminder in terms of what we've covered. Um, that Rob talked about how the Inspire partnership um, in his multi-academy trust, the global curriculum for primary school, examines the core purpose of education in a complex modern society, and that young people should have agency within that within that that realm. Uh, and I, I got a real sense that children were understanding global links and could see that their work is connected looking you know in examples of even you didn't mention it now but i know you've looked at things like the abuse of power as a theme from egyptians and romans to world war ii uh, and really sort of right across the spectrum but looking outwards and upwards all the time leading to very high quality learning and shalina of course showed how you know her own engaging and inspiring work really on decolonizing the curriculum and how building in these opportunities to raise the racial literacy of all staff in our schools is absolutely key to supporting that success and that support from leadership. And Kate has explained to us how Challenge Partners model for accreditation by practitioners to ensure that only the best practice is identified and shared. That's really important. We don't want to be recycling mediocrity in our system. And she's touched, I think, on the fact that you need trust uh, in this particular model and the right kind of social skill set to enable us to transfer that knowledge uh, and thereby create this really strong peer learning environment, which I hope we, we put across. Um, and how, how really effective learning partnerships help schools um, to be the best they can, uh, but can also within our system accelerate those in, in the greatest challenge to, to, to do even better over time. I think it's a very effective form of peer learning which we've been delighted to share with you today 
Uh, and I think we've put our, our, our sort of uh, our details in the in the chat there if you want to contact us and we'd love to hear about your own models of peer learning and your communities. So do get in touch um, and uh, we look hopefully look forward to hearing from from some people after this uh, event. So thank you very much. I think we're bang on time. Join Time Magazine's lead education reporter alongside global educators and advocates to explore the impacts of teaching forgiveness. I teach forgiveness because it can have a positive impact in my students' families. It helps my students thrive in the face of adversity. Students who can forgive are happier. Join us to hear from teachers and thought leaders on how and why to include forgiveness in your classroom. will bring widespread devastation and unprecedented extreme weather. New coronavirus cases emerge across the country. Obesity rates have more than doubled in kids. Cape Town is running out of water.
I thought that sounded great. It's very hard to tell when you're in the middle of it, but watching it, I thought it all came together really well. I think we're live. Um, should we set up a Google chat quickly to debrief? Alice, is that possible? Uh, yeah, I think it would be best to chat on your. I'll, I'll end this event if that's OK. Are you emailing it through or putting it in our diaries? Um, yeah, I, I, I can put it in your diary. Yeah. yeah. We go on. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. See you in a moment. <laughs>